happy to be here. And this morning, I understand uh, people who come out at 8 o'clock in the morning are people who really love God. <laughs> so, but I understand we have some leaders in the house, pastors, leaders, ministers. Would you raise your hand? Well, bless the Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. I want to minister this morning, not just to leadership, but to everybody in the body. I want you to turn in the Bible to 2 Kings, the second chapter. 2 Kings, the second chapter. Everyone can hear me all right? And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah unto heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elijah, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, as I, thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went to, where'd they go? Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came, from Eli came forth to Elisha and said unto them, Knowest thou? that thou, Lord, will take away thy master from thy head today. And he said, yeah, I know it. Just hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord sent me to Jericho. If that ain't Jesus, don't answer. <laughs> he sent me to Jericho, and he said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went to, where'd they go? Jericho. And the sons of the prophet that were in Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry here, I pray thee here. For the Lord hath sent me to, where? Jordan, and said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophet went and stood a view afar off. And when two stood by Jordan, Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, and that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah and said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I will be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a what? Let a what? Of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, and behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind unto heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes, and he rent them in pieces. And he said, and, and he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank Jordan. God bless the reading of his word. Now we're going to pray, not over the word, we're going to pray for ourselves. There are so many distractions that come in church today because we live in a fast world. The word doesn't need anointing, but our ears do. <laughs> so let us pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus. We ask that you would release the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this place. God, giving us ears to hear what you are saying this morning. That we would not just walk out inspired or encouraged, but God, that we would walk out changed and change the environment we walk into, God. In the name of Jesus, we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. 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 You may be seated. Hallelujah. There was a, a man that all, all he wanted was to win 
this 10 mile marathon swim. And so he began to practice. He began to go out and swim in his swimming pool and practice and practice every day for two years. And then it came time for the, the, the race, and there were 665 people entered into this race where they would have to go and swim out, go around a buoy, and swim back for 10 miles. And the race began. He was happy because he had practice. He had, he had worked hard for two years. I mean, through the rain, if it was raining, he still went out and, and swam and practiced. When it was cold and the ice seemed to frost the ground, he still went out and, and swam in that cold water. You know, whatever it was, when he was tired, he just, he just was faithful. <coughs> and so now the day of the race had come. And sure enough, he shot out in front of everybody. He was swimming good. He, was, he had a lead in front of everybody. And, and he felt real good. All the way out to the last buoy, he come around, he's still in first place. But just about a quarter mile before he won the race, he got real tired and somebody caught up to him. And they were racing head to head. And, and he was swimming as hard as he can. And yet the guy seemed to pull away from him and pull farther away from him. And the other guy won the race. Now he came in second place. Although he beat 664 other people, he wasn't counting on second place. You know, he was counting on being the winner. He had worked so hard and it seemed like he just didn't did, he came up short. When I read that story, I thought, well, you know, that's such a disappointment. It's kind of like life. You work so hard and end up short sometimes. But as I read on, I began to read about this young man. And I began to understand that he doesn't have to hang his head low anytime. He was a winner. You know why? Because I began to read and find out that this young man only had one arm. He only had one arm. If he had another arm, it's no question he would have been number one, right? But he only had one arm. But he never has to hang his head down low because he did the best with what he had, with what he was equipped with. Sometimes we're not equipped with everything we have, but then sometimes we're equipped and we haven't done the best with what we've been given. All hear me now. Sometimes you're under good teaching. Sometimes you, you, you're under good principle teaching of the Word of God. And then when it comes out in town to do things, you're equipped. But we don't quite work as hard as this young man. It's a way of life. Yet we all want more, don't you? I mean, who wants more of God? It doesn't make no difference how long you serve him. You should want more. You should, like this one, want an extra portion, a double portion. Elisha was basically the understudy of Elijah, and what did he do? He carried his bags. He got him water. He did anything to serve him. It wasn't just now he's the understudy, and, well, I don't do bathrooms. <laughs> I don't clean. I don't... I don't I don't carry tote stuff. No, he was a, a representative of servant leadership. He served Elijah and everything. And now it came time for him to leave. Elijah is about to be taken up. And he knew it even before the prophets had to say anything. He knew it. <coughs> and they were in a place called Gilgal. Now, if you know anything about Gilgal, Gilgal is a place of tradition. It was a place uh, where they instilled the first Passover again, a place where they crossed over and they set up a, a monument. Gilgal represents a place of tradition. And they went from Gilgal, he said, I, I, I'm going from Gilgal to Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. And during that time, there was a division of the house of God. You can read it from the prophet Hosea, that, that there was a division 
in the house of God, uh, there wasn't real worship. You know how sometimes you can sing a song for so long that you can sing it and it don't mean nothing, you're just singing it. You know what I'm talking about? They had lost their, their sincerity. There was idolatry in the temple. It was wicked. The prophets were prophesying against uh, the temple at the time. But Bethel is a place called the house of God, a place where you worship, a place where you enter in. And so he says, I'm going to Bethel. And Elisha says, Elijah says, you stay there, I'm going to Bethel. And Elisha says, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. You know, I like that. You work so hard, you ain't going to let go now, are you? Come on, think about it. You've been through so much, you're going to give up now? Now's the time to turn back because it got hard? No, that's not the time. He says, no, you going, where you going, I'm going. You ain't leaving me, I'm I'm sticking with you. Like gum on my shoe, we're together. We, We like peanut butter, stuck to one another. And see, he says... He says, now, when he gets there, the prophets come and say, hey, we have a word for you. We had a word for you, Elisha, that your master is going to be taken up. He says, yo, I know. (laughs) Just keep your peace. He already knew. Then Elisha says, "I, I need to go to Jericho. Elisha says, I'm going with you. I ain't staying in this house. I'm going with you. Where you going? So he comes to Jericho. Jericho represents a place of victory. You remember Jericho? They marched around in the walls of Jericho. It represents total victory. It represents the walls not just coming down, but it being all, everything just being wiped out. It's a victory place in Elijah. And he came to a victory place, and he hung out with Elijah in a place of a victory. And then God called Elijah to where? Jordan. He had to cross over the river. Isn't that right? He crossed over to a place called Jordan. And as we know, Elisha ain't going to let him go by himself. Elisha went with him to Jordan, right? And, And we know as we read that it was in Jordan that he got a double portion. It wasn't in Gilgal. It wasn't in Bethel, even though it's a, the house of God. It was in Jordan. We crossed over to Jordan, and he got a double portion. And he only got a double portion, even though we asked for it. It was a hard thing. And he, there was a requirement for that double portion. What was it? He had to see it. He had to be there. There's some places you just got to be. Some places it's the right place at the right time. You got to be. Now, in in this endeavor of serving God, let me communicate this morning through this illustration that sometimes when you come to God, you can get religious, you can get traditional, you can get stuck right here in this chair. Feels so nice, uh, so comfortable. This is so good. I'm doing the work of God. I'm ushering. I'm showing up. I'm I'm teaching. I'm showing up. Aren't they thankful that I showed up? I mean, they just don't know what I got to go through. By the time I feed my kids, get home from work, and, and now they want another meeting, they just be thankful. You know, I come to church. Most of them are Sunday church goers. At 8 o'clock, they ain't here this morning. (laughs) I hope. (laughs) At Wednesday, they may or may not show up. Why? But when it comes time for a special meeting or special holiday, they're going to be right there in the Sunday bed. Traditional. You can get stuck in your religion, in your Christianity, in whatever you label it, Right there at Gilgal. You observe all the, and honor all the, all the things that we do in church, but guess what? It'll never get you a double portion. In leadership, 
Leader, let me speak to leaders just for a moment here. In leadership, sometimes people have this concept that now I'm in the church, now I've been saved for a couple years, now I've, I'm serving God, now I'm in a, leader, I'm a leadership position, and now I'm qualified. So now that I'm the leader, everybody got to listen to me. All of a sudden, I got a little walk, and I got a little jump in my step. And even though I say, praise the Lord, sister, praise the Lord, brother, when you're going to come join the choir today, uh, you don't get the right note. You're going to have to stay. Uh, praise the Lord. And in that leadership, we get arrogant because we think we know now. And then when we're sitting with people, we got to, we got to tell everything we know. In leadership, you can get stuck. In leadership, you can work and you can get in a pattern of doing the same thing. You, you, you apply yourself, you get ready, you go to church, you minister, you minister to, on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, whatever schedule you have, and you get so wrapped up in the ministry that you lose people. Now hear me, it's not that the people leave right away, or they may not leave, but when you look at people, you're not treating them as people. You're treating them as a means to accomplish your ministry. A means to accomplish your position. We live in a time where a lot of people look for a position and they want to know what my gifting is. The Lord willing, I want to talk about gifting on Wednesday. But you want to know about what my gifting is and we strive so hard to, to step into our gifting and there's nothing wrong with desiring gifts, the Bible say. There's nothing wrong with that. But what comes wrong is when I step on people to get it. When I don't care about people. Let me tell you, the, the ministry is people. Jesus didn't die for this building. But we thank God for the building. Hallelujah. But he did not shed his blood for the building. He shed his blood for flesh and blood. He did not die so you could just go to heaven. He died so dead men could live. Because we're all dead without Christ. We're, all, we're already judged. We're children of wrath without Christ. He died so you could live. And that ministry of reconciliation we bring to other people, we as ministers have to take a lesson from Paul and we need to examine ourselves often. It's not something we do in church because we're giving an altar call. No, it's something we do in private when the doors are closed and nobody's watching and you're not impressing anybody that you're sitting there with God and God alone and you examine yourself and see if you're right feeling in the faith. As leaders, we're not exempt. We must examine ourselves often. We must examine our motive because our motive will, co uh, will control us and cause us to walk in places that God would not have us go. It may look like God. It may be a good thing, but it's not anointed to break the yoke. Because if you think about it, we all have needs. But when we mix our need, I really need this. You know, I really need a ride to church. Then when I call my brother, I'm, I'm talking about my need. I'm not just, you know, how you doing, brother? I'm just calling check on you. I have a, you had on your mind. I want to pray for you. The Lord bless him. The Lord gave me a word this morning while I was talking that, you know, he's going to take care of that problem. And I just want to, you know, know I have this need. And so now, oh, man, I ain't got a ride to church. Oh, oh. Call my brother. Hey, brother, how you doing? God just put you on my heart. I just, I just, uh, been praying for you. And, and uh, you going to church tonight? You, you think he'll swing by and pick me up? Now, he ain't heard from me all for the last two weeks, but now he hears from me. And now I say, well, the Lord told me. No, the Lord didn't call me. I had a need. And because I had a need, when you mix your need with your motive, you, it will always come out corrupt. It's just like when you're giving. Pastor talk about giving. If you give just to get, it's going to be corrupt. But if you give knowing that God loveth you 
And He's going to bless you. He may not give you money, but He may bring food to your door. He may not give you food, but He may bring salvation to your children. He's going to fulfill a need. There'll be blessing overflowing, increase. Why? Because you gave without a, a motive. You gave not expecting anything in return. You walked in sacrifice that God, partaking in His suffering, not expecting. I'm giving because I love God. Yes, I have a need, but no, I'm not going to let that need decide what I'm going to do or not do. Because that need may be, oh, uh, uh, you know, I'm going out to dinner, and, well, do I give any offering or dinner? Well, I only give uh, two or three because I got to eat in my... We going out to a nice restaurant. My need has corrupted me. No, in that moment, if I'm led by the Spirit, the Spirit says, give it. It's not, but God, I, I won't have nothing to eat then. No, it's I give it, not expecting in return. That's sacrificial, right? For the minister, we got to stay out of tradition. If we do that, then what happens? I've seen it over and over again. You go somewhere and increase will come. Why? Not because you did it to get it, but because you did it for him. You just did it for him. Tradition, leadership, we must check ourselves that we don't get stuck here. And, and where did Elisha go? To the house of God, Bethel. And in the house of God, there can be corruption. We can praise God. That's where the yoke's supposed to be broke. We worship him. We praise him. There's power that comes in praise. Like Pastor said, sometimes only a praise will do. You know, that's true. There's sometimes in my life where I've been where money couldn't fix it, but people couldn't fix it, authority couldn't fix it. I'm at the bottom here, and all I could do was look up and say, God, <laughs> I throw myself on your grace and mercy. You know, however long I have to go through this, God, I'm going to stand up and go through it. There's nowhere else I could call. It talks... That, that's talking purity in our heart, in the house of God. But let's face it, sometimes we come to the house of God just because it, that's what we do every Sunday. Sometimes we sing. Do you remember a time? Do you remember a time when the Spirit of God grabbed you when you were in a service sometime and you couldn't help yourself? And I'm not talking about a little tear come down your mouth. You just uncontrollably couldn't help yourself. You felt the power and the presence of God and it began to change you. And in that moment, it didn't make a difference what happened in your life. It didn't make a difference you don't know how you're going to pay the rent. It didn't make a difference your children are running wayward. It didn't make a difference. In that moment, all that made a difference was the Spirit of God permeating you, saturating you. You remember that moment? And then you sang that song, and when you sang that song, it wasn't just singing a song. It, it was coming from the inside out. It was everything. There are times I've seen people in the presence of God, just break as they would sing. Now, it's not the song, but what they're saying they mean in such fervency of their heart, it's like God comes down and, and just kisses heaven and catches them between. In the house of God, they went to the place. The prophets there, you know, told them, yeah, oh, you know, he's going to die. I already know it. I don't need that mess right now. There's a time and a place for everything. And then Elijah said, I need to go too. I need to go to Jericho, a place of victory. As we go from the house of God, if we can break through real, genuine praise and power, we will get victory. And when we go to victory, that's when we can shout. And sometimes the shout is our victory. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you don't see it. You can't feel it. You don't even know it. But you know this. It's time to shout. There was a time I was ill, and, and God said, you're healed. And that day, I had fever, and I was dying. And the doctor said, you're still dying. And my wife said, no, God said, you're healed. And I said, okay, we're grabbing a hold of that word. We embrace it. When you embrace it, you don't change your mind five minutes. 
You, you don't change your mind when things get worse. You don't change your mind when pain, pain increases and everything on the outside looks like you're getting worse and not better. You embrace it. You stand firm and you say, God has healed me. The next day, doctors come in. I'm still dying. Me and my wife, we are embraced in the spirit of the word. And we say, no. God said we're healed. I'm still running fever. I'm still, the third day, I'm still running fever and still dying. And they say, if they don't do this procedure, you're not going to live another month or so. But here, you need to do this. And we said, no, you can take another scan. And they said, your fever, your, you have not changed, you're getting worse, everything that's in here will not, will not go away by itself. We've got to cut you open. I'm not cut open. We embraced the word that God gave us. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I am just a man. I didn't want to die. I have a, a, a beautiful family. I have a, a four-year-old. You know, I, I have children. I didn't want to die. You understand what I mean? I ha but I was ready to die because of a long time ago I had already died. So it made me ready to die. I didn't want to die, but I was embraced in this word. So they took a scan. When they took a scan, everything they said would never happen began to decrease and happen. God began to move. My kidneys that were not functioning, God touched them and they began to move. What they said would never happen, happened. Why? Because sometimes the victory is in the shout. Sometimes you don't see it, but you got to speak it and believe it. Why? Because the Word of God said so, and it's enough. And in that victory, that doesn't mean you get a double portion. See, some people get stuck in praise. So they just love to pray, come to the house of God and praise, and they get stuck in this chair right there. They're happy to do that all the time. Some people get over here in victory, and the, and the praisers, they, oh, there she goes again. There she go dancing again. There he go shouting again, running again, you know. Some people get stuck and they, uh, they don't see where that person has been and what he's come through. And the reason that he shout and look all crazy and undignified, well, because of where he been. He got victory. But still, that don't give you a double portion. You see, there's a pathway. There's a pathway to the house of God. There's a pathway to victory. And there's a pathway to the double portion. We come into this thing, we could sit right here all day long and get stuck. Why? Because the things we do out there are more important than what we do in here. We get so wrapped up in the system, in the world. We, we, we want a new car. We want a new house. We want a new dress. We're trying to get money. We're chasing the money. And, and it's like putting money in a bag with holes in it. In that system, it just keeps going and going. And if God takes me right here in this place, I don't have anything fruit to give him. I'm so wrapped up in my tradition, I'm not winning souls. But I sure do look spiritual. You can get stuck here, but the pathway breaks off and you come to the house of God and you come to a place of real worship and praise. And, and that praise that leads into the worship that changes the atmosphere. You, you meet God. It leads to what? Victory. <laughs> a victory. A victory sometimes you have to shout before it comes, but it's victory. <laughs> a victory where all the obstacles you know, no man has done it. Pastor didn't pay for it. You know, your mom and daddy didn't pay for it. No, God brought a miracle. And he's the only one that can get credit for it. But even then, in your Christian walk, and leaders, because leaders, you know, like I was saying, sometimes we think we're more mature than what we are. Sometimes you can be in leadership and you think you arrive. 
You know, it, our school system is like that. In America, you, you have junior high, you have high school, you go high school graduate, you get a diploma. But then you have college. And then you go to college, you go, depending on what you are, for four to nine years, and then you get a, a thing to hang on the wall. And that's supposed to tell you you qualify. I tell you the truth. When I got out of seminary, I was less qualified. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I thank God for seminary for a, a biblical foundation in understanding biblical truth and understanding some of the stuff they gave me wasn't truth at all. <laughs> but they didn't teach me how to deal with people. And I don't know about you, but people can get on your last nerve. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes people get under your skin. Why? Because, you know, though I'm saved, this body ain't saved. Though I'm a new creation, I still have to battle the flesh. Come on, I ain't the only one here. How many of you this week got angry? Raise your hand. How many of you got offended at somebody? Somebody got in your... You, how many of you just weren't kind? Most everybody, somewhere along the line, waving that. You, you know, but yet, we as Christians, what do we know? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, fullness, faithfulness, self-control, right? We know that's the fruit of something coming out of our life. Just like that anger is the fruit of something coming out of our life. Anger, depression. You know why people get depressed? Outside of demonic attack, depression is selfish. I don't know why I have to walk down this path, but depression is selfish. Let me tell you why. You remember a little child, everyone, everyone that's had a little child or been a child, when you didn't get what you want, what did you do? <laughs> Throw yourself on the ground, kick a scream. Your mama come and, and, and whoop you for it. At least my mama didn't stand for it. You ain't going to act that way, child. That's why God gave me a right hand, child. I believe in healing, so I'm going to hurt you right now, child. The Lord said you would not die. I ain't going to spare this rod. You ain't going to be acting this way. But we all, we all are selfish in nature. And because of that selfishness, hear me now, because everybody sometime in life will deal with depression at some point and to some degree. And some people go so far they don't seem to recover. But everyone experiences it. Why? Because we're used to getting what we want. And sometimes when, when a, a parent just don't want to hear the child cry, here, here, here's a piece of candy. Be quiet. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> As a child, I may not talk, but I understand, ooh, that tastes good. You know, I'm going to try this again. I'm going to cry. This time I'm going to kick my legs. Maybe I'll get two pieces. <laughs> it becomes nature. You don't have to tell a child how to be bad, do you? It's that sin nature, that rebellion that's bore up in a child. And what happens is we get all upset. We didn't get what I want. And, and, and a young man can go through life. And now, and now, how old are you, son? 21, how old are you? You got 18 and 21. When he's 18, how old are you? 17. He's 17, he didn't get what he wants. So he kicks and screams. Except he learned he looked he look pretty foolish if he on the ground cried. Can't do that because he's cool. Now, at church, he's, praise the Lord, Pastor. Thank you. When he's with his friends, he's, yeah, what's up? <laughs> Girl, what's your digits? <laughs> but at 17, he didn't get what he wanted. So what does he do? He pouts. With mom and daddy, he pouts. Or he rebels. At 18, he does the same. As a 21, he learns a little bit about life, and instead, what does he do? He starts to get depressed. I can't get what I want. Why? He gets depressed, and he's depressed all the time. Why? 
because his selfishness is him rise up, and he just wants what he wants. And, and when you don't get what you want as a child, you get you throw a tantrum. Now it's a tantrum. It's just not a baby tantrum. It's an adult tantrum with sophistication. He don't handle it when he get married or she during their marriage that's trouble. Anyone in marriage say amen. There is trouble. I don't care how much you love God, how much who you speak in tongue, there's going to be trouble in your house sometime under the rainbow. Why? I can't, I can't teach you why really now because the, the biblical truth is we don't understand our biblical manhood and we don't understand our biblical womanhood and we're not walking in that path. Therefore, there's going to be trouble. But when a woman is in depression that's outside of physical or I just had a baby or, or whatever, outside, when she's in depression, it's because she ain't happy at home. Yeah, that boy, he just leaves his clothes everywhere. I just tied it. In five years, I've been picking up these clothes. And it, what do you think I am? I, you know, come on. You know, I, we can't afford a, a maid or servant to come in here. He could at least help sometimes. I got the kids, I got this, and he come home and get, sit in the chair and watch TV. And he don't, you know, he don't know how tired I am. He don't understand me. But that guy at work understand him. Oh, girl, you look good. Oh, you the best. Oh, you just so beautiful. Oh, you just so wonderful. And all, she gets her needs met somewhere else, right? We have so much trouble and division. Why? Why? Because of depression? Depression? Why? Because we've given an adult tantrum. We have not truly surrendered every area of our life over to God. And understand, just because you surrendered and got saved over here doesn't mean there's something in you that doesn't have to die. This flesh will always rise up and you got to kill it. And the longer you wait to kill it, the more problems you will have. It's just a fact of life. You will not get to victory by not killing the flesh. See, part of victory, even in Jericho, when they had victory, they were given instruction and they had to follow instruction. Sometimes, you know, I told that man to do this. He just don't listen to me. I told that woman to do it. He just don't. There's no submitting one to another. So how can there be victory or even a double portion? In leadership, it's the same. We can get victory and we can stay right here and never accomplish really what God has called us to do. And that's to cross over. See, there, there is a power that exists above what you have experienced in your Christian life today. If God is so vast, and, and, and the knowledge and the power that he has would fill this, this room, and what we know and, and everything that we have, even the experience of the Holy Spirit, would be held on the tip of my finger, then there's more than a double portion. It's just Elijah happened to ask for a double. He didn't say triple or, or quadruple. But there's more to God than you ever realize. You could spend 5,000 lifetimes and still not tap into the vastness of the God that we serve. And if you can't tap into his vastness, then you can't tap into his power. So the power that you feel in the Holy Ghost <laughs> is not all that. Oh, you can dance it right, you can speak in tongues, you can shout it right, but guess what? God still has more for you. But not many people crossed over. Remember, there are 50 prophets that stood on the bank from afar and watched. Watched them go and watched them come. They had a word. They operated correctly in their gift. They had a true word, but yet they stood on the bank. They didn't cross over. They didn't even have a desire to cross over. There are people in life that go through and think they arrived in leadership and they just, I'm settled right here. That's what I do. I ain't doing no more. I ain't crossing over. Because it costs you to cross over. It does. Not many people will ever cross over. Now, I'm not saying you can't get a double portion of what you already have. 
But a real double portion is not ending. You don't arrive. And he had to cross over. And when he crossed over, there was a requirement of him. Salvation is free, but there is something required of you when you serve God with all your heart. That righteousness has to be there or you shouldn't be in leadership. You can't be running, uh, running, chasing skirts and then coming to church and trying to fill a leadership position as a single man. No, it can't happen. Why? Because you ain't, what you get is not a double portion. What you get is not really the Spirit of God. There's another spirit that is, that is endeavoring to enter the church. Why? Because the Bible says so, that in the last days there will be a delusion that comes, a deception that comes. The famine will be true. So here we are. We, 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 at, we at Gilgal. Where are you? Because every person under the sound of my voice sits in one of these places today. You may have come here, and to everybody you may look as spiritual as could be, but guess what? You may be sitting right here at Gilgal in tradition, stuck. Your praise is just motioning, singing the songs. When you come into this place, you just sing the songs. You don't enter in. You don't enter in his courts with thanksgiving. His gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. You just stuck. When you got saved, you were all on fire, but now you're stuck. What bewitched you? You may be sitting here, or today you may be over here. You in the church, you love the praise, you love the wor worship, but guess what? You ain't got much victory in your life. You come and you hold a position and you praise and worship, but when you go home on Monday, you have so much argument and turmoil. You have, you know, if, if, if there was a fly on the wall and, 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 and it recorded everything that happened in your house and we showed it up here on the big screen on Sunday, you wouldn't come. You understand what I'm saying? You have the praise, you like the worship, but you just ain't getting the victory. Why? Because it's a journey. Life is a journey. Just because you got saved, you ain't completed the journey. Just because you went through Bible school don't make you qualified. So now you have to take that step further into victory. And that victory is a step of faith. And in that victory, it's all right to stay there a while because it's all right to enjoy victory a while. But understand, you, just because you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people in life are just between here and here. They, they get the praise and, and, and they get a little victory. And this week they got the victory. Hallelujah, Pastor. Thank you for praying, God. Just, I want to testify that God has been better to me than I've been to myself. And, and God has answered my prayer and got me that thing. And then next week they're back over here just trying to get a praise. Yeah, Lord, yeah. I hope they're going to have some good music today. You know, those are the people that sit and say, Pastor, move me. I hope he's going to preach something good. Oh, he's preaching about obedience again. Oh, well. That's not victory. Somebody may be sitting here. Somebody may be back and forth. And there may be somebody in the house that say, listen, I desire God. I desire more. God, whatever it takes. If I've got to cross the Atlantic Ocean, God, give me more. If I've got to cross uh, all South Africa, give me more. God, if I got across the room and turn the TV off and the computer off, God, give me more. Whatever it is, God, if I got to push away from the table and not eat all that good food, God, give me more. Whatever it is, I need to cross over. I'm at a place in my life I got to cross over. Nothing can hold me back. No, God, you don't, I don't want to be left behind. God, it's like Moses. If, if, if you're going to go, go with me. Let me see your glory. I want more. And pay the price for more. But understand, when I pick up that mantle on this side, <laughs> it's only just begun. I have not arrived. I have not arrived. Pastor, I've taken up too much time already. Would you come? Would you allow the Spirit of God to move in you this morning? And would you answer the question, 
where am I? Am I in Gilgal? Am I stuck? Am I in the house of God? I just wait to see the miracles, love to see it happen. I'm satisfied to be here, but I really don't have victory. Or do I, I have some victory and I need, I need, I need more? Is, is it all right that we minister? Would you come? Oh,